Hello, uh, my name is Paul. Um, my, my company name is CHX Photography and I'm a, a documentary photographer. And uh, I will be talking about my work in Mongolia, which is uh, an area or a country that's close to my heart. And uh, I like meeting everyday people in Mongolia. And my purpose or my reason for being there is I work for NGOs. So I promote, promote the cause. We sell my images and hopefully we raise money and awareness for uh, the charity that's out there. Thank you. Paul, thank you for, thank you for, for being here. Thank you for your time. Uh, how are you today? I'm good. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's, uh, oh, it's, it's an honor. It's, uh, it's, it's such a pleasure from my side. And we will talk about many of your projects, which we can see mm -hmm. behind us. We are in a, um, we are in a gallery. We can see uh, pictures of, of Paul's project, which we will definitely touch base on. Uh, but first of all, mm -hmm. uh, I would like to ask about a bit about, about your past. And um, I read that, uh, that you, you changed your job a few times mm -hmm. and you also spent uh, two years of your life in a, a sailboat, uh, uh. traveling between London and and some Mediterranean yes. islands. Yes. Could you tell us a bit more? Like, well, I, I, I you mentioned I've done five different careers, five jobs, uh, all very very different. I wasn't particularly good at any of them, but I, I, I'm one of those people that just drifts from one good opportunity to the next. And at the time, I was a farmer, and I met my future wife <laughs> on the uh, on the farm, and we. Um, we ended up building a little boat together. She was, uh, had already done a transatlantic. She was an experienced sailor. And uh, so we built this, it was tiny, it was 27 foot uh, steel hull wooden decks. And we sailed from, from London to through France. You can lower the mast and go right through the middle of France. So 222 locks. And wow. we ended up in set on the south coast after two months. And uh, we sailed around the Balearic Islands and, and ended up on the east coast of Spain eventually. So that was two and a half years. Wow. Yeah. Wow, 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 wow. With two little dogs. It was a great experience. Great, yeah. great, great. I would love to do that one day. Just like, just go from the port to port and be free with, with your yeah. family, right? Yeah. So, yeah. so you didn't feel yeah. lonely over the time. And, uh... Uh, it was, we were quite, I was pretty young at the time. So we didn't meet many young people because usually that's a, it's somebody does that when they've retired. So we, we came across a lot of, I mean, not that it matters, but we were kind of like the youngsters <laughs> and we had, we had dogs with us and, yeah, yeah, and our yeah, boat yeah. was very pretty. It was very small. So in France, it's oh, très joli, the mm -hmm. uh, petit bateau, like kind of, they were very cute and very nice and friendly with us. So it was an amazing experience, but very difficult as well because we were on a very tight budget. Um, we, yeah, we, we lived on very little and it's, you have to be super tidy, uh, methodical and it's uncomfortable most of the time because you're living in a cramped space. Oh, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So How big was the boat? 27 foot. So that's only, I forget now, it's eight meters, something like that. Wow. It's tiny. Wow. It's a tiny little space. We, wow. We're living in this little space here. Mm, mm, mm. With two dogs, so it's, <laughs> it's a pretty, so, it's so, intense. So if you are making fight, who is jumping to the water? You so, or, mm. or <laughs> <laughs> actually, she was amazing. She would be able to cook when we were at sea. If I went down, I would be sick. So I would be sailing with the dogs and their little life jackets on the top, and then she would be down. And so I would keep keep separate. Wow, yeah. wow, wow, wow. Yeah. crazy, crazy. And could you tell us a bit more about yourself? Where are you from originally, and how did you end up in Hong Kong? Uh, I'm uh, from Zimbabwe originally. I moved to England to join the British Army. Uh, I did that for three years. And after that, I ended up being on this farm, figuring, oh, this is what we do in Africa. We're farmers. Let's, let's, uh, let me do farming experience. Uh, I, met, I met my then wife and I um, uh, went through that. But then I ended up doing university and I did different things. Uh, I did mineral surveying. A surveyor after that. This is what we talked about uh, yeah. previously uh, before we start to record yeah. that. It's a very unique uh, thing which we should actually talk about 
uh, next time when we meet, like yes. something about stones, etc. Because you are you are an expert, uh, <laughs> so so it would be. I would uh, I would love to. I've forgotten most everything you invested. <laughs> but yes, yes, thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then uh, so then so you were you were in in uh, that was in London, right? In UK. Yes. Yes. And then then you were sailing. And uh, what about Hong Kong? So Hong Kong. So. Uh, with my wife, my then wife, we went, I keep saying my then wife, we went back to uh, the UK and we, we separated. So obviously living in confined space was not great. Uh, I then came out and ended up marrying a man. And uh, so it was a, I mean, it was like a big, a big time in my life. And, and at this time, uh, with my experience in Spain, I learned to do plumbing and build walls. I did basic electricity on a, on a house that we lived in in a, in a very remote region of Spain with had no water, no electricity. The roof was falling down, but we spent a year and a half rebuilding it. So I, I went, when we went back to London, I conned my way <laughs> to say <laughs> that I was a plumber because I figured that water runs downhill and what else, you know, yeah, it's, it's yeah, quite yeah, easy. Yeah. So, and uh, I became a plumber then for, for eight years. Wow. Um, I, I spent six months on the phone asking people how to do things as a plumber because <laughs> I wasn't <laughs> qualified. But uh, I got I got by and it was fine, so uh, eight yeah, years. Yeah, yeah. And then photography in the meantime was was always a background passion which I'd picked up from, from childhood. From largely my dad, um, the Natural Geographic collection in our house and, and all that kind of classic photography which mm -hmm. I think had a huge impact on me. Okay, yeah. okay. So when when actually do you decide to change the passion into your daily work? Um, uh, when I was a plumber, because I, I really loved mixing with people. And my favorite part of being a plumber was when I met the <laughs> client. And then I thought, oh, no, I better go and fix the toilet. <laughs> I'd rather just talk to you and have a cup of tea and then go home. And I thought, I, I mean, but then photography was... I was at that time when the internet wasn't so strong. I was just buying so many magazines. I was spending loads of money on magazines, uh, photography magazines, and becoming obsessed mm -hmm. with everything photography. So, um, yeah, I, that's why I did. I started off with food photography actually because I had a friend who ran a restaurant, and they said, "Oh, we got an online yeah, yeah, thing." Yeah, so yeah. I, I I worked for them. It's uh, Ottolenghi. They they're pretty famous now in, in the UK. So. Uh, not because of me, <laughs> <laughs> purely their own work. <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, so I did food photography, and that, uh, it's quite a technical uh, discipline in photography. But my real passion was, was meeting people. And then the opportunity came when I moved to Hong Kong with my partner. Uh, I went from part time plumber photographer to full time plumber. Uh, full-time <laughs> photographer. <sorry. laughs> and that's why we are here. It begins with P. I knew it was <laughs> because, something like that. Because I need to ask you about how to fix my toilet. So <laughs> that's, that's really good. <laughs> no, okay. but, um, I'm an artist now. My hands are uh, too soft. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, jokes aside, yeah. Uh, you, you have an like, amazing um, eye for, um, for capturing people emotion and and I would love to talk about that okay. um, you also mentioned that so you started from a food photography you, I know that you also explore um, fashion photography and events so you are doing like all spectrum of uh, photography yeah. so what and, and of course documentary now which we focus the most yeah um, so what do you like the most and the least I, uh, I oh well, the least would be maybe for us to do weddings for people that I don't like. <laughs> or if it's a very okay. commercial thing, because weddings are very, very personal. And you have to, so I do them for love now, so it's for friends and, and that's it. So because you, it's a, it's a privilege to be part of their day and you are, I mean, you're right in the back room scenes where they're getting changed and it's super, super personal. So uh, it's a privilege to be there and then that's when you can, Give them everything uh, and do your very very best. Whereas, like as a commercial, when there's money involved and they don't know you, and then it loses that that yeah, edge. And then yeah, I, I yeah. just feel I just i become like a machine, and it's not a nice feeling. Yeah. But yeah, I guess yeah. that, that's like any discipline in life is sometimes you have to do these machine things in order to to put food in your your stomach. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. Yeah. But, uh, so the documentary is one that I love. Um, it doesn't feed me, but it. It has uh, repercussions on many people if if uh, if I'm helping them. Absolutely, so. absolutely, and and it's definitely a piece of art what, what you do. And um, maybe um, uh, we have here a, a book uh, which you uh, 
uh, started with Red Hero. Uh, so that's the documentary project which we want to talk about. Yeah. Uh, so uh, could you tell us what Red Hero is like, and when did you start to work with the NGO? Yeah. Um, Red Hero is actually my tattoo as well. So this is... Uh, wow, on the entire arm. This is uh, Ulan Batar, the capital city of mm -hmm. Mongolia. So Red Hero has nothing to do with me. It's the, the direct translation of Ulan Batar. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I went first went there in 2013, and I've been working with an NGO there, which uh, works with it's a daycare center. So there's now up to 60 kids that go there every day, which frees up the parents, usually single parents, usually mums, who can then go to work and, and earn a living because. There isn't government support. They don't just sit at home. So it's, uh, mm -mm. it's very, very tough there. If you've got minus 40 degrees Celsius winters, then the parents cannot leave their kids unguarded, and, but then they can't earn money. So, uh, yeah, yeah, so this daycare yeah. center, which is in the Gare district, which is on the outskirts of uh, UB, Ulaanbaatar, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's very important. Yeah. And it's not government funded. It's, mm -hmm. It is an NGO. So. Mm -hmm. Wow. It's and such an important mission, um, I guess, to, to for for the kids to to get the chance to to learn, right? Because the, the center, I guess, uh, yeah, provides uh, teaching. teaching and they have a doctor, in-house doctor. They have a chef. Um, just whilst talking about the, the chef, a lot of the kids there have never eaten vegetables, and they, <laughs> it's crazy. Wow! Like right up to six, seven, eight years old, they've never touched a vegetable. Maybe maybe potatoes or crisps from the, the corner shop, but it's, it's, uh, it's a very meat, dairy, flour-based uh, diet. Uh, and crazy. if you're poor, that's all you eat. Yeah, if you're, carbs if you're just to get energy, that's vegetables it. Vegetables right? are for rich people. Uh, yeah. it's, um, it's quite interesting. So, uh, yeah, the chef is there to give them a, a more of a balanced diet. Otherwise, it's, they're not getting great food, I think, uh, wow. usually. So, so how, how how this actually started? Because you, you were here in Hong Kong, and yeah. and then that's a project in Mongolia. So, how these two cities are connected? Like, what is uh, what is the origin? Like, why the NGO started? Uh, I met an amazing woman here in Hong Kong. Her mm -hmm. name's Bridget. She worked for uh, Adam Linklater's. The uh, they are lawyers, so you know them. And she, I said, to her, I, I've got very few women in, in my <laughs> portfolio. Can I photograph you? And she said, well, come to Mongolia and photograph me there. And it was really her, her idea. She said, I know oh, this wow. charity. Maybe we can work with them. And we, we came up with Red Hero One. And we went to Key Club, which is a very fancy location here in yeah, Hong yeah, Kong. Yeah. We had Christie's, the auction house. Um, who That's were so great. Running the auction. And Red Hero One was a huge hit. I mean, made shared a lot of money for, for the charities. It was a big, big, uh, big, big success. So, um, yeah, Red Hero One was, was... And then I thought, wow, this is amazing. I really feel I have a purpose and a reason to be there in Mongolia. Mm -hmm. and, and, it, mm -hmm, and it's mm -hmm. making my photography. It, it just really flew. I just felt it grow. And I thought, oh, wow, this is... Yeah. I feel so good. This is, and this if is you here. love something, then it will, it will be good. So, yeah, 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 yeah. so that was Red Hero One. Wow. And now you are um, on Red Hero 3, we've right? We've had three, and yes. uh, now we have like a, a collection, <laughs> so, yes. which yeah, is on yeah, the internet, yeah. so people can still buy the images, and uh, the, all the, the proceeds go to the charity. Mm -hmm. um, so it's been, it's been very successful. Okay. Um, but I'm running out of friends <laughs> to, buy, to buy my images, so it's. Uh, well, that's why you are there, you know. If you want to, <laughs> if you want to help children in Mongolia, in the suburb of, of the capital, who they are, they are really suffer. Um, you can mm. do it in very small cost. Uh, how much is the book? The book is uh, 600, Hong, 600 Kong, Hong Kong, and all the proceeds go to to the charity. So I'm still currently paying off the, the cost of the book. I think I'm, I've sold about 190, so we, I need to sell another 20 more and we'll break even, and then there's another... 300 books to go, which will all be profit. So Fantastic, fantastic, uh, fantastic. It's early so, days, guys, but we're getting there. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And it's, it's, it's a great project. And I guess uh, a lot of people would like to have your your photography. And let's maybe focus about this. So what exactly are you doing in Mongolia? What is your, your mission? What do you want to capture on your Okay, photo? so um, my mission is to, to photograph everyday people because 
I have this thing about originality. If somebody's taken the picture before, it's, it's a huge turn off for me. And I hate going to a place where you see these amazing places in India where they're all throwing pink dye and stuff, but then there's a hundred photo photographers all taking the same thing. So I've got this thing about being the only one there, the only one person doing it and being original. And in Mongolia, we associate it with uh, wrestling and eagle hunters. And, and, and whilst I have photographed them, I'm more interested in everyday people, the, the people that they're not really being documented. And this is an important time, I think, uh, in Mongolia's history where there's this big move from the, the countryside to the city and they're living in gears, they're still burning coal to keep warm uh, in the winters. And this is, these are Mongolians, they are everyday Mongolians. So I, I really love meeting those people. It, they don't Amazing. need to be in their fancy outfits, they, jeans, a t-shirt, and but still riding horses and doing what, driving cars, that's what, it's just everyday people. And for me, that's most interesting. Wow, wow. Yeah. Do you, do you have uh, like uh, families which you are always visit there when you uh, are, Yes, when you so the family is associated with the, the children's charity. It's called uh, tiffcharity.org if mm -hmm. you want to find mm -hmm. out more about them. But uh, they really, the family connected with this charity have been my enablers. They have able, enabled me to get into people's homes, which as a white person, I would never have, or very unlikely to have being given access. So it's a very, very privileged, it's a, it's a privileged position for me. Yeah. So uh, say for example, this, this grandmom, her, her daughter is the founder of the, of the charity. So her and oh the aunties goodness. and the cousins and the, everybody, they all, we all jump in the car together. We, we head off to, a, to visit a family and uh, we say, oh, uh, this family's at risk, we're here and we need to decide whether their kids should come and stay at the charity and get their food and everything yeah. so we all go off and then we meet them and then they know i'm there i've got my purpose i've got my reason to be there i'm not just taking the pictures for myself mm -hmm. and then we uh, we exchange food and i give them polaroid pictures and it's so it's like a it's like a reward everybody's or a ripple effect everybody's benefiting yeah, from yeah, yeah, from yeah. our presence which is what i really learned it's not just about me so uh so we would go into all these places just every day and all my pictures are just everyday people. And uh, it, we, we learned through the times. In the early days, I got it wrong a lot. I'd been, cause, uh, I've been in some marketplaces in UB and Ulaanbaatar where if I got my camera out and just photographed somebody, they would be super angry at me. And mm. I've been chased, somebody grabbed me and was wrestling. I mm -hmm. uh, had to jump into a taxi once and speed off and the guy was banging wow. me on the side of the car. Wow, wow, wow. Uh, my How icon, many people live in this kind of... Uh, in the Gare district? Just, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, there are, I think, one and a half million people in, in the city, but in the Gare district, I'm sure probably a million. Wow. And you can imagine that those million people are all burning coal yeah, in, yeah, in the yeah, winter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It makes you be one of the most polluted. Yeah. cities in the world in winter but then in summer it's blue blue sky and clean but mm -hmm. um yeah in my early days so i'm in, in the market for example and people are chasing them and also i call him my bodyguard to make me feel important <laughs> he would be my translator and he would be telling me everything quite often he would get abuse actually and they would say how can you let this foreigner take our picture and oh, wow. uh oh, and okay. it was quite i was i mean i was quite shocked and I didn't, I always do things out of respect. I don't want to uh, disrespect them. So um, I completely changed the way I did things. I hid my camera, we'd go in, we would talk to everybody, offer cigarettes. Mm -hmm. So in a lot of my photographs, you'll see people smoking. <laughs> <laughs> hey, okay, Sorry. that makes sense. Sorry, Mongo. <laughs> and the kids, sweets, uh, or Polaroids. Yeah. So you... You get them on your side and then yeah. uh, with genuine intention, I'm not. Yeah. And then we say, oh, my, my bodyguard would then say, um, we're here to photograph. We're working for the kids. Is it okay we photograph you? So we ask mm -hmm. permission first every single time with, or without doubt, every time I've learned to do it. And they may say no or they say, yes, fine. That's, and then and then away we go. But we, we learned these lots of little tricks because in the beginning, everybody would sitting like this yeah, to attention yeah, 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 yeah. and the kids especially exactly. waiting for their picture and then they start getting bored oh, yeah. the white man is still here is he gonna go what's he doing and then that's yeah. then that's when the magic happens for me it's when they relax and start looking around and then i feel like a dynamic 
Uh, okay, oh so it's yeah. the the point is to to wait enough so they are Usually. they are like losing <laughs> focus and then uh, it's yeah. free them. I'm waiting for them to. I, I know my pictures are doing nothing, but it's it's like a game. And yeah. eventually, I'm thinking, oh, I think something interesting is going to happen. So it's kind of mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, to, to build this kind of trust, what would you usually say when you are going in? You are meeting completely new people, like they are probably in their very small houses, yeah. right? And probably they are not very fancy, so maybe they are a bit ashamed. Like, how do you break the ice besides uh, of the cigarettes? Well, actually, they're <laughs> super. Yeah, they were very, very proud people. And rightly so. I mean, they've got so much culture and warmth and they're very, very hospitable. So when we go in, it's like, it's uh, formal greetings. There's places within the gear that the most senior or the visitor person would sit, which is usually opposite the entrance. And then they, you sit down and everybody's given tea and this gets all very, very formal. And all the kids sit there very polite and they're all watching. I mean, yeah. I, it's adorable. I just completely love it and we all just sit and then everybody just talks and my cameras are still not out at this time I'm just waiting to see if it's okay and should we be there or shouldn't we be yeah, are they going to yeah. be comfortable and, yeah, yeah 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 so it's it's about the steps of yeah like don't yeah. don't put the big guns out uh, straight yeah. away because don't, anyway. yeah don't don't be a tourist I yeah, think that's yeah, the thing yeah, I have yeah. in my head is I don't want to it's I just hate it I hate just they're not circus like animals. steal someone someone yeah i think so it's yeah, yeah. I, I, i want people to be comfortable and that i think i hope is one of my gifts is people feel comfortable around me i, I don't make them feel uncomfortable i never judge them i never think higher or lower i just i, I do genuinely feel we're all the same so it's yeah, like yeah, a, yeah, yeah, yeah. i think people realize that oh this person here is, is here for good reason yeah, yeah. and then and, and then it's hopefully reflected so a lot of my pictures people are looking right at me yeah. and uh, it's like it's it, there's a trust yeah uh, there's another oh, it's down now but there's a mm -hmm. woman breastfeeding mm -hmm. uh, and then it's magical i mean it's uh, i love that kind of that, the sense that they are comfortable with my presence or it's like i'm not even there in some cases yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Mm -hmm. and i have to say that this book it's not uh it's not i saw a few like ngos books also created this way like photographer went somewhere and then you look at the book and you want to cry because everyone are sad and miserable your book it's a this book it's different like yeah. you show people who are smiling who are happy who are maybe a bit maybe upset like all kind of emotions right like gather in and some of them yeah. are dirty faces like i'm playing around but i'm still happy i am here and yeah. I, I, the fact that that i may be poor it's not changing the fact that I cannot be happy. Like, I mean, it's just, it's so, so this is a really nice representation of it. And um, yeah. Yeah. I, I really love the fact that think, you, you show the real side of them. Yes, I think people are rich in other ways. I mean, I mean, of course, there are many, many rich people and there are many, many poor people, like anywhere in the world. And, uh, but what they are really rich in is their sense of identity. And I really, I really love that about them. When you go there, they are so proud that we are Mongolian and this is this and people have their defined roles and it doesn't men do this the women do that the kids do this and it's i don't know it's it's a very seems very balanced i think that balance has been rocked is when they move to the city and then the problems happen and the drinking uh vodka is a huge problem unfortunately in the city but uh yeah that's that sense of identity which i i think is is so beautiful and for me it's so unique um, the way they sing the way they Uh, the family are their best friends, and and everybody's related to everybody. Yeah, yeah, everybody yeah. knows cousins, oh, really? cousins, and oh. uh, it's a very it's a sense of community. Which I think coming from my background as a as a white guy from Africa, and a very colonial background, we we don't really do we have community? Not really, not like them. And I think that's why I really I really love that uh, to see to see how they are with each other. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And, and I think it pays for them to act like a community because. Their, their weather can kill you because if you're if you're not being looked after by your neighbor or uh, if, it's, if you've got minus 40 degrees outside you want to know that it's there's right, that yeah. there's food available there's tea um, 
Wow. It just reminds me of a little story, if you don't mind. Yeah, like yeah, people, yeah, please, please, please people, go for it. Um, we always have time for stories. That, that's, <laughs> that's, that's exactly what I want, like stories. So in, anywhere in the countryside, so they're always, my book is divided into two parts, the city and the countryside. And Mongolians always say, oh, he's a city boy, he's a countryside. And they're quite different in many ways. But in the countryside, in a gear, it's like a yurt, a traditional house, it's quite okay just to walk into a stranger's house. And they often don't knock. So they'll just go straight, straight in and sit down. And there's nobody there. They will help themselves to a cup of tea, make a tea on the cooker. And then they will leave some tea or some cigarettes for the, for the next person or when the owners come back. And then they'll move to the next one. And there's no kind of sense of, in England where we've got walls or, or anywhere, and we've got walls and boundaries. We, we don't let people in. We, we don't have that kind of sense yeah, of yeah. Uh, trust. So often I, we'd just go and sit in the house and sitting with this old lady and then suddenly the sons and the daughters all walk in and there's all these strangers <laughs> looking at her and I'm thinking are they they don't seem fussed at all that there's five strangers sitting in the house <laughs> they just are oh hello hello someone all someone all good morning how are you have some tea nice bye bye and it's <laughs> it's incredible I mean I I think we don't have that anywhere in the world because uh, they have this uh this, this sense of community, this amazing connection with the land, uh, this amazing connection with their animals. Mm. Uh, I mean, it's one of the few times where I think, because I'm considering being vegan, <laughs> I suddenly thought, but it just wouldn't work there. But I like the way they rear their animals, uh, and even the way they kill their animals, actually. It's a very respectful, and I've witnessed it quite a few times. And obviously, it's quite gruesome, but at the same time, it's done in a very humane way. What, and, what's uh, the, what is the way of vegan? Uh, so I've seen goats and sheep. I, I think you can't do it with bigger animals because they're mm -hmm. too big. But because um, they also eat horse. Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. sheep, they make a little incision. They lay it on its back like that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, one guy is putting it down and make an incision. He puts his hand into the the thing and he grabs the aorta of the heart and he he pulls it off. So that it bleeds internally. But every time I've done that, the sheep or the goat made no noise. It's extraordinary. It's crazy. So, and then they maybe have a little and then that's it. Really? And then he wow. would kiss it and say, thank you. Within half an hour, it's just a head. And then the women who are not allowed to witness the, the killing, they would then cut it and clean it. And yeah, yeah, yeah. then everything, everything is used. Wow. It's extraordinary. And uh, yeah. uh, I, I, love I love that. I love this way too. Yeah. I think it's, it's, nat it's natural for them. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And there is no waste. There is like, you are actually using all the parts. So it's, uh, yeah. And they are really well. So the animals, and you wake up in the morning, all the goats are standing outside. <laughs> they, when they were born and raised as little kids or baby sheep, they would be in the gear with the babies. And quite often you'd see a baby tethered with a piece of rope and with a, a baby goat or kid. And then they would look after each other for an hour whilst mom went and milked the horses, for example. Uh, it's, so there's a very, the, all the, the baby goats are very friendly. And then they wow. grow up and they go out and then... Wow. Yeah, it's quite wow. interesting uh, relationship. Wow. So yeah. it's, it's a lot of like human, animal. Very as much well. so. And it's okay. reflected in the way they sing. And they, all Mongolians can sing. They have unique ways of singing. Uh, they, they've got this throat singing. Uh, they can do two different tunes at the same time, which I don't think anyone else in the world sings like that. It's, it's crazy. And all their songs are based on horse sounds or the sound of the eagle or the sound of the, the running. Uh, they got a horse fiddle, which is this beautiful, Crazy. like a violin, beautiful instrument. Beautiful. Um, yeah, there's a huge connection with the spirits of the land and the people. And, the, and I think that makes them amazing. Yeah, That's yeah. why I love them so much. Oh, so nice. So nice. <laughs> yeah. Are you planning to go back to Mongolia soon? I've been 13, 12 times since 2013, and I'm hoping to go back in September. Uh, yeah. I, I can't. I can't keep going. I can't stop going. <laughs> <laughs> I know I've done a book, but I feel I just want to keep, Con, yeah, keep, yeah, keep going. Yeah. Oh, so nice! And I hope you will also capture the transition. Like maybe some kids which were in a bad condition yes. previously, but now because of what you do, they are in much better yes. shape and they grow up and they they start to work and they are happy in yep. again, so. I've been following some twins actually I, I photographed them as babies originally and now they 
they're, they're little toddlers and they're going to the local school. So, I mean, it's a success story. Um, amazing. Uh, yeah. Amazing, amazing. And for, actually, if you can tell us like one story, which is very close to your heart, like the one person which you photographed, which um, had like just, just move you. Oh, um, um, so it would be a sad story, actually. Normally, they're always very happy. And we so with my with our team and usually a, a local social worker who would say, oh, we've got this one family who are on the at risk list. It's usually the dad is an alcoholic or something like that. We need to go and see if the mom's OK. So we went to this in the Gare district, they have dirt roads. There's no all the houses don't have running water. It's a typical Gare district scenario. And uh, we went down this little alleyway. It's minus 15, which is not that cold, actually, for, <laughs> for Mongolia like, in it's winter. It's like taking sun temperature, right? <laughs> it's, it's why, I mean, people don't wear gloves at minus 20. That's how hard they are. It's so tough. But wow. uh, So we go down this little alleyway, and we knock on the door, and this very, very drunk woman comes to the door. And evidently, she has three kids living in one bed with her, in a tiny, tiny little space. And those three kids go to the charity now and, and they go to the school and stuff. But she was, it was 11 o'clock in the morning. She was just wearing a little thin jumper. It's minus 15. She's so drunk that she can't light a fire. She can't, in, inside the house, uh, it's all, it's just stuff everywhere. And she's, she's a mess. I mean, it was so, so, so sad. And initially I thought, oh, well, I'm definitely not going to photograph her because this is, it's not respectful and I'm not achieving anything by photographing her and it's, it's, it's not my business. So we're thinking we're going to go. But then she held up a family portrait and I, in my book I call it the family portrait. And it's this, uh, I mean, oh, it's incredible. She's, her family, in, when everything was okay, and it's, they're all wearing beautiful clothes, traditional Mongolian, this family portrait, everything's so formal. But the portrait she holds up is kind of form, it's symbolic, it's falling apart. Uh, she initially didn't want me to photograph, but then she said it was okay. So I photographed her with, with the portrait, right. and uh, it, it was crazy. When we walked away from that afterwards, we thought, wow, that was just so intense. I don't know how the kids are surviving, and she she can't look after herself. Yeah, uh, she's not properly clothed. And I mean, she's uh, yeah. How she it was it was so that was very tough to see actually. Uh, and then somehow the little kids are going to school. I don't know how they must be looking after themselves most of the time, yeah. and then getting benefit from the, the charity. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, oh wow, wow, well, wow, well, well. yeah, yeah. And probably you, you actually uh, hear it and see so many of these kind of stories there as to to like what what alcohol and uh, other like drug use can can do to a family, yeah. right? Yeah. So, um, um, yeah, we came across one child where it had a, a cancer and it had this huge belly. And I was saying, what, what do you do? I mean, they, they've got no money, so what do you do? I'm thinking, is there an international red cross? or yeah, you just, yeah. I'm just like a photographer and my work colleagues at a charity. I mean, we're not connected. It's like a, you just suddenly feel, oh, what, what do we do? And how do you, and you can see the mother, yeah. her look appealing on you to go, can you do something? And uh, it's very tough because you. Yeah. Uh, but fortunately, oh, there are many NGOs that once you find the right avenues, then you can. Uh, it takes a bigger people and yeah, yeah, stronger yeah. connections to, to deal with such things. Yeah. Because we were making decisions. We would go and see a family, and we would have to decide: Are they poor enough in order for us to accept them? <laughs> I'm yeah, thinking, yeah, yeah, yeah. Who am I to say that? And we would go in there and we would we'd look around and say, "Is it?" Is it tidy? Was it dirty? Yeah, 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 yeah. And if it's really tidy, that means they're coping. I mean, it's mm. it's a very strange uh, yeah. scenario, really. How many kids can be in school in one time? Like, what is uh, the capacity? Up to sixty. It's a lot. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. So TIFF can do. When I first went there in 2013, only about 10 kids, and now they can up to 60. So talking about, about your technique, can you tell us what kind of cameras are you using and what do you like to use the most? Okay. Um, I had a Canon originally, a 5G something, uh, but it was quite big. And if I if I do this to you, it's quite. And, and that's and as I said earlier, in the early days, people would chase me, and I I didn't like it. So I wanted something that was smaller and more discreet, but at the same time had a, a beautiful quality to it. 
And uh, so I, I sold my flat and then <laughs> <laughs> I bought myself a motorbike and I bought like a, I've got like a cameras now, which mm-hmm. are they which small one? and I had a, the M240 and then I've now got an SL, but I use M lenses. Mm-hmm. So it's, uh, I mean, it's gorgeous. I love Beautiful. It. Beautiful. It's not so discreet, but it's, <laughs> I mean, it's the feeling. Uh, for me, that's part of the process. It's, it's I mm-hmm. really love working with it. So mm-hmm. you're more likely mm-hmm. to use it if you really like it. In point of editing your, your pictures, is it, are you doing quite a lot or you, you prefer to make it as raw as possible so um, there will not be much? There is some editing and process. sometimes a little bit of cropping if there's, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, but mm-hmm. generally not. But uh, when you see a finished product like mm-hmm. these, it's because of uh, Danny Chow in, in Hong Kong. He is the guru of, of printing and he's been doing it for 30, 40 years. So he, he makes all the, the colored tones and the, he makes them all balanced. He makes them slightly, gives them some grit uh, to make them a little bit edgy. Um, oh, wow. I didn't know. Actually. Just a little bit, just a little bit. Um, uh-huh. But for example, this one I use a 1930s uh, Dalmaya lens. It's an English cinema lens and it's 80 something years old. And wow. it has this beautiful softness, but pin sharp in the middle. So I'm looking for character the whole time. This, again, going back to originality, I don't want something to be, well, I've seen that before. I want something yeah. that has, uh, it doesn't need to be perfect, but it needs mm-hmm. to have character mm-hmm. and a mm-hmm. uh, uh, soul, I think. Absolutely. I think my lenses have souls. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Especially yes, my, yes, yes. my little Dalmaya, I'm completely in love with it. Great, it's, great, uh, great, great. And uh, what about the, the, the near future? Like, are you planning to continue with Red Hero? Do you have any other project uh, ongoing? I feel really determined to carry on with them because it's, I guess in some ways it's like me being a, like a, a, a daddy Founder. to, to yeah. be able to go and say, oh, I'm look, I do, do something. It's, it's very small, but it, it, it's sort of part of that purpose. Uh, I also have to do other things. I'm photographing jewelry at the moment, which is... Uh, which actually I'm really enjoying. It's it's against my nature because you have to be extremely methodical and precise and, and everything. But I'm actually really enjoying it. But uh, yes, there is. I do want to go back and keep going. So I'm going back in September, and uh, I'll, I'll I'll keep pushing it. And now, what's your work routine? So this question I love to ask because um, a lot of people are actually listening to the podcast to also like get more creative and get empowered and sometimes you know especially when you're working in corporate business and you are just tired like how to get creative how to get to this creative mode i mentioned a word earlier it's about having purpose so if you have a reason or purpose to do something then it becomes i mean not just a purpose like oh here's money here's that is a purpose and there is a reason but quite often you say oh i my purpose is to do this for these people and to make the project uh, bigger than yourself i think has been a huge lesson i learned it's not just about me taking selfies on instagram yeah uh, it's yeah. all trying to make me look good i'm actually everybody is benefiting from it make it bigger than you because then it will go further yeah, and it yeah. can be something as simple as we meet a family we exchange tea we have a laugh and then we leave no photographs, it doesn't matter. They've still benefited from it. But if we do get a picture, and we are very lucky that it ends up to be on a wall eventually, then it's victory for everybody. And then, uh, yeah. yeah. But then the, the hard bit is the balance, the sustainability. So uh, I need to be more savvy with money, I think, to, <laughs> to get to get it to to, uh, to look after me at the same time. So, of course, of course. Um, there is there yeah. There's be. a balance. There's a balance. Yeah, yeah. and the, in point of uh, the time when like is is like are you are you prefer to work during the day during the night? Like I know some artists, uh, for example, they they start at 10 p.m. and continue until the sunrise. Oh really? Right? Or like what is what is your <laughs> your really what, a, you are actually about the people, right? So it's like your it calendar is probably on on, on on that. But um, do you have or like are you working always with music or with coffee? Do you have any like? Oh, like just a simple I'm always case. working with vodka. <laughs> <laughs> okay. In Mongolia, every time. Okay. You know I'm Polish, right? So I can, uh, yeah, I can do that too. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, uh, the vodka is very good there. No, I, with there, I, I just, I take whatever. I never say no to anything. So we say, oh, we're going to meet a family. Do you want to go? Yes. Say, so, okay. So then the family gets together. It takes like an hour to get ready because there's so many jackets and coats and the cars being warmed up and 
Then the cars trap because there's all the cars are parked around and we can't, and the traffic is a nightmare. We can spend two hours getting to where we want to go because the traffic is terrible. And they say, oh, we need to go to the bank. And then I'm thinking, oh, we're not going to meet the family. Oh, yeah, 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 we're going to meet. And then they get oh, on the phone yeah. for about two hours. Oh, the family's not there. And I'm thinking, it's now three o'clock in the afternoon. I'm meant to be having an exhibition. I've taken no photographs. It's this constant little frustration, yeah, but yeah. I learned to be very patient the whole time. So we would get maybe 20 minutes with the family. And I would go in there and I, I would feel it instantly. And I'd say, okay, now we're going to. You get so in the zone where you're just completely present, actually. It's a beautiful feeling. I've, I've even been in tears afterwards because I'm thinking, oh, my God, I met that lady today. She completely, it just blew me away. So you are so present, but it's a 20 minutes where you're just feeling everything. Just how are they? Do they look comfortable? Do I feel this is right? Mm -hmm. It's really it's just being very, very present. And yeah. it sounds cheesy to say that, but it is like that. Did I mention about... Of this area we want to cover, or is it anything else which you would like to touch base on? Um, other than I do other NGO work, not just in Mongolia, I've been in Cambodia. I work for Hagar International. They are uh, they work with young girls who have been trafficked. Uh, it was fascinating. Um, I couldn't photograph them because their identity needs to be protected and everything. So we looked at an angle that would be maybe connected. So I, I, I went on the train tracks every day in Phnom Penh for two weeks and I walked up and down photographing people that I met. And it was just magical, magical. I loved it. Um, wow. And so when, when we can see this work happen? So it happened two years ago. So oh, it was one of my so previous events, but okay. it was all because of this concept with Red Hero, I, I approached other NGOs and I'm still doing it now. I'm going to say, can I, can I, can you use me? Can I, can we work mm. together and, mm. and try and make something amazing happen? So, uh, yeah, I worked in Cambodia and that was a huge success. We had a big auction, the same thing with um, selling the images. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, it was, yeah, it was great. I found out at, at the exhibition, somebody came up to me and said, you know, Paul, where you were working has the highest incidence of rabies in the world. <laughs> oh my God, all those dogs. I saw loads of dogs and chickens and... People on the railway tracks, you know, it's like in, you see in those films where the, the train goes through and people lift their clothes and their food off the thing and the train goes through and then yeah, they yeah, put yeah, everything. Yeah. It's really yeah. like that. Crazy. Yeah. Mm. And now um, I wanted to ask, so this this question, it's quite hard and I always asking this. Oh, okay. um, <laughs> uh, and I, I just, you just love to, to, mm -hmm. to see uh, your first guest. So the question is, if you have a, if you had a chance to hang out with, um, any famous artist, dead or alive, who would it be? Bruce Lee. Bruce Lee! <laughs> wow, nice, nice. Why is that? Do you want to learn? Uh... Well, I just think he was so cool and so ahead of his time. And he yeah. really brought Asia to the West. I mean, it's kind of in a Hollywood style, but... Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, then yeah, when yeah. you start to... Sorry, when no. you start to uh, read about him, he, he had a back injury at one time, so he stopped all his training and he just read about philosophy. And... Uh, Oh, I don't know he's, about that. He's fascinating. He's a very, very smart, intelligent, beautiful man. He really impressed me. Yeah. So, awesome. yeah, I would love to just meet him. I've been to his ancestral home in Guangzhou, uh, which is quite fun to see. So, yeah, I would awesome. like to hang out with him. Awesome, awesome. <laughs> very, very good. Very good answer. <laughs> Last question, but very, very important one. So, where your fans can find you online and offline, how we can help you to to do this amazing work and help others. Okay. Um, well, we are here in Oiling Gallery. It's uh, In an, Soho, antiques. Hong Kong. If you are visiting Hong Kong, if you are in Hong Kong, please visit. It's Your exhibition is on uh, this. I had an exhibition here and we had 20 images on display. Most, most have gone, but there are still some up. And my book is still for sale here. So that's Oiling Gallery in Hollywood Road. Um, also online, I have... My Instagram is a great way. Everybody's using Instagram more than Facebook, really. Uh, um, so I am Paul Cox, but I use C8 and the number 8 and X. Because mm -hmm. 8 is a, it's lucky yeah. in, in Asia. And also there are many, many Paul Cox photographers. Yeah, <laughs> if you go yeah. online, there's about eight of us. There were three in England, the famous one in Australia. <laughs> I thought, how boring is that? <laughs> so I've got it C8X uh, underscore okay. photography in uh, Instagram. 
Uh, yeah, that's the best way to get hold of me. But the book is 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 a surefire way to 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 support the works that I do. Mm -hmm. uh, and happy to do that. So I will, you know, I will include all the uh, the the, the uh, places which you mentioned about yeah. in the show notes. So uh, so we have everything very clear. Uh, yes. Where to find what, and we and and uh, as as you will have new updates about where uh, where it's your next ex exhibition and where we can see your book. Yep. I will also update it, uh, so you can just check out uh, the Arta app website. So I think that's it from my side. It was such a pleasure to chat with you, and I wish you best of luck with with all your projects. Thank and you, they are Italian. they are very meaningful. So thank um, you. I was in one moment when we were talking, I was like almost like I had a tear in my eye. And I was like, don't cry, don't cry. Just look at the wall. <laughs> um, I thought it was. <laughs> but, <laughs> I thought you had an allergy or something. Yeah. <laughs> Allergic yeah, to like, the furniture. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's nice. No, Thank you. Uh, no pleasure. Thank and, you. Uh, and chat to you soon. Thank you very much, Natalia. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.